Okay, thanks for joining us today. At the end of this session, I hope you'll come away with a better understanding of scope specifications and what kinds of features are available in today's instruments. This session is geared towards choosing a scope for your bench. We are likely to be doing most or all of the research on your own. If you're considering a scope with bandwidth above 1 gigahertz or for special purpose testing, you should probably talk to an applications engineer to help you make the right choice. During the presentation, I'll talk about the specs that determine the signals a scope can measure. Then we'll cover the latest features that can save you time or let you do things you couldn't do otherwise, like find intermittent anomalies or support specific standards or applications. And then we'll talk briefly about environmental factors like portability, data transfer, and remote control. Throughout the session, you'll hear me use terms like basic, mid-range or bench scopes and high performance. On this slide, I try to give you a rough idea of what I mean by these terms. Note that the scales on this chart are sort of pseudo-logarithmic in order to fit in all of the bandwidths and prices. Also, the performance realm goes higher than 20 gigahertz and it also goes higher than $200,000. In this first section, we'll be talking mainly about specs and how they're defined and applied. As we talk about scope specs, you'll find that you need to have a pretty good understanding of what signals you're going to need to look at. Are you looking at mostly audio signals, mostly digital signals, transducer outputs? If you're looking at digital signals, are you going to be evaluating rise times or just looking at approximate timing relationships? Are you looking to use the scope to qualify elements of your design or mostly as a de debugging tool? In any event, you'll need to do some soul searching before you start looking at specs. One of the first, perhaps most obvious things to consider is how many and what kind of channels you're going to need. Except for some very basic hobbyist level scopes, most scopes have two or more analog channels to allow you to compare the timing of signals. The analog channels have to be designed for really good range, linearity, gain accuracy, and flatness. And they have to be reasonably robust. I mean mainly electrically robust. They can't break every time you connect a cable after shuffling across the floor on a dry day. Most of the scopes out there today are digital storage oscilloscopes, so the analog channels are sampled to provide data for storage and display. In general, the more channels the better, but since many of the critical components of a scope are in the analog front end and the sampling system, adding channels adds to the price tag. An MSO, or mixed signal oscilloscope, adds digital timing channels which indicate high or low states. Since these channels are often used to work on computer-based systems, digital channels come in bite-sized, that's B-Y-T-E, chunks of 8 or 16 bits. Recently, Tektronix introduced the concept of a mixed domain oscilloscope, or MDO. These instruments include the same analog and digital channels as the MSO, but they also add an RF input channel that behaves almost like a spectrum analyzer. Bandwidth is one of the specs that determines how a scope relates to the signals you want to look at. Scope specs usually represent bandwidth in one of two ways, either as the minus 3 dB frequency at the high end of the bandwidth or as a scope rise time. The two specs are related. First, we'll talk about the usual way of specifying bandwidth. All oscilloscopes have a low-pass frequency response that rolls off at higher frequencies. Oscilloscope bandwidth is specified like a simple low-pass RC filter. That is, we specify the bandwidth using the frequency where a sinusoidal signal is attenuated to 70.7% .7 of its true amplitude. This is the minus 3 dB point, or half power point. And the same as with a low-pass filter. We assume that the input is a pure sinusoid. What you see here is a typical log-log frequency response plot for a 1 gigahertz oscilloscope, including the characteristic roll-off and specified minus 3 dB point. One of the things you should notice right away is that the bandwidth, at the bandwidth spec, the scope can be around 30% low. You can tell this is important because I made it red and put an exclamation point after it. You may also notice 
that at one-fifth of the bandwidth spec, the response is still pretty flat, and the error due to the roll-off is relatively small at around 2%. Pay attention to this last point because it's going to come up again when we talk about the first rule of five. In addition to understanding the concept of scope bandwidth, it's important to have a good understanding of the frequency components that go into your signals. If you're dealing exclusively with sine waves, then life is simple. The highest frequency you're dealing with is the highest frequency of the sine waves you work with. However, if you're like most of us, you're going to be looking at signals like square waves or rectified sine waves or pulses or transducer output signals. For signals like these, it's important to remember that the highest frequency of interest is often much higher than the repetition rate of the signal. As you probably remember, non-sinusoidal signals can be built by overlaying sine waves of different amplitudes and frequencies. These different sine waves make up the spectrum of the signal, and it's important to consider them if you want to get an accurate representation of your signals. This slide shows, shows how a digital signal, really a square wave, is made up of a fundamental frequency, third harmonic, fifth harmonic, and so on. At least the first few harmonics have to be captured in order to get a representation of the square wave. If scope bandwidth excludes the harmonics, you'll lose the shape of the waveform. You'll notice that as I add even higher harmonics, the edges get steeper. This shows the relationship between bandwidth and rise time. I'll talk more about rise time in just a minute. So in general, a higher bandwidth will provide a more accurate reproduction of the signal of interest. Remember when I showed the roll-off curve of a typical scope? I said that the response was pretty flat until we hit one-fifth of the bandwidth. While the actual roll-off of a scope can vary from scope design to scope design, this one-fifth relationship is a good rule of thumb. So to determine the oscilloscope bandwidth you need to accurately characterize signal amplitude, follow the five times rule. If you choose your scope to have five times the bandwidth of your signals, you should expect less than 2% error due to roll-off. For example, if you're working with 20 megahertz sinusoids, you'll want to choose a 100 megahertz scope to get accurate amplitudes. This slide shows how bandwidth is presented on a scope data sheet. For those who work with digital signals, it's often easier to think in terms of rise time. This slide shows the effect of capturing a signal with about a one nanosecond rise time at three different bandwidths. To illustrate the relationship between bandwidth and rise time, we captured the signal on a high performance scope that has a filter capability on its input. The time scale here is four nanoseconds per division. You'll notice that at 500 megahertz bandwidth, the edge is slowed down quite a bit. As the equation on the slide suggests, the rise time you see is the combination of the actual rise time of the signal and the rise time of the scope. At 500 megahertz, the scope adds slope that isn't part of the actual signal. The high frequency components of the signal are being attenuated. At 2 gigahertz bandwidth, the waveform is truer to the actual input signal. And at 8 gigahertz bandwidth, the waveform shows even more detail. But at this point, you need to decide whether the detail is important enough to justify this price tag of a scope with 8 gigahertz bandwidth. So higher bandwidth scopes will be able to accurately display faster rise times. Just as with bandwidth, we have to account for the roll-off characteristics. Again, we use a rule of five, as shown on this slide. As an example, to look at a four nanosecond rise time, we would need a scope with a rise time five times faster than four nanoseconds, or 800 picoseconds or less. I've shown where you can find this on a typical scope data sheet. Sample rate is, is an important spec because most scopes today are digital sampling oscilloscopes. They convert analog signals into digital values, and the rate at which they do it is the sample rate. It's given in samples per second. In general, the faster the scope can sample, 
the less information you'll lose and the better the scope will be able to represent the signal under test. But the faster you sample, the faster you fill up your memory, so this limits the amount of time you can capture. The spec given in the datasheet is almost always a maximum. To balance sample rate and recording time, digital scopes change their sample rate with the horizontal scale. Scope designers try to keep a certain number of samples per division to make sure you get good resolution for all horizontal scale settings. You will probably need to flip through the manuals, but you can often find a table that shows the sample rate for each time per division setting. Some instruments will share the sampling system between channels to save some money. This means that the number of channels you turn on can affect the sample rate. Whether or not the sample rate changes with the number of channels turned on is usually shown as a footnote in the datasheet. In order to avoid aliasing, the Nyquist theorem tells us that the signal has to be sampled at least twice as fast as its highest frequency component. This rule of twice the maximum frequency should be viewed as an absolute minimum that will prevent gross distortion. Remember that the highest frequency component of your signal is often much higher than the repetition rate of your signal, and it's a good idea to be able to have visibility of higher frequencies to see details. At the fastest timescale settings, the scopes will interpolate between samples to fill in the trace. Most Tektronix scopes use a sine x over x function to fill in the spaces between samples. This type of interpolation is optimized for sinusoidal waveforms, which form from our discussion of bandwidth and from school we know are the basic building blocks of complex signals. Linear interpolation is simpler, but not as good for representing sine waves. The graphic on this slide shows the difficulty with using straight lines to build a sine wave. If a scope uses linear interpolation, it's going to need faster sample rate to accurately draw a sine wave. Tektronix recommends another rule of five here. We suggest that your sample rate should be five times faster than the highest frequency component of interest. This will give you good detail and is more than enough to avoid aliasing. Most of our scopes maintain this relationship. As an example, I've clipped a data sheet for a 500 megahertz scope. The fastest sampling rate of 2.5 giga samples per second allows you to capture five samples for each cycle of a 500 megahertz sine wave. Record length is the number of samples the oscilloscope can digitize and store in a single acquisition. Since an oscilloscope can store only a limited number of samples, the waveform duration or length of time captured will be inversely proportional to the oscilloscope's sample rate. This relationship is shown both in the equation above and the, in the example data sheet. Longer record length combined with faster sample rate helps you get more detail. Remember, when you're using a digital scope, you can usually increase the sample rate by using a faster time scale up to the maximum. But faster sample rates eat up memory faster, so you need to longer record length to acquire with more samples. Just an aside here, since we're talking about billions of samples per second, adding longer record length isn't just a matter of popping in a few more RAM chips. The whole sampling system of an oscilloscope has to be carefully designed and scaled to deal with the memory while maintaining very tight timing specs. The most important reason for having a trigger function on an oscilloscope is to allow you to stabilize the trace on the display. The oscilloscope's trigger function synchronizes the horizontal sweep at a specific point on the signal, and the trigger controls set that point. This was especially important for analog oscilloscopes that couldn't store individual traces. With an unstable trigger, the signal becomes jumbled on the screen since the drawing begins at a different part of the waveform each time. This is the picture on the right. The most basic trigger circuit is the edge trigger, and all scopes have this capability. Pulse width triggering is also available on most scopes, and most scopes include special provisions for triggering on video signals, since they're complicated and can be challenging to stabilize otherwise.
A single trigger causes acquisition of all input channels simultaneously, so the signals are all time correlated. This is true even when the scope includes digital and serial signals, or RF signals. These are the basic performance specs. Now let's talk about some of the more advanced features and time savers that are available today. I already covered basic triggering as a way to get a stable display, but today's scopes go way beyond this. They also provide tools to help you zero in on really specific parts of complex waveforms and allow you to capture anomalies like runt pulses, setup and hold violations, and narrow glitches. For years now, some scopes have been able to trigger on combinations of inputs. What we call logic triggering lets you, for example, tell the scope to trigger when all channels simultaneously show a logic high. More recently, scopes are able to trigger, trigger on serial data as it occurs on the input channels. For example, you can tell the scope to trigger when it sees an ASCII question mark on an RS-232 serial bus. I'll talk more about serial bus options later. The list here on the slide is just a sample of some of the advanced triggers, and unfortunately we don't have time to go into all of them. Maybe I'll do a follow-on session if the demand is there. There are even more triggers available on high-performance scopes. User manuals are a good source of information on the latest triggering alternatives. With today's long record lengths, search tools have become almost as important as trigger tools. Capturing an anomaly is only a good first step. Once you catch it, you still have to find it in the scope's memory. You'll want to check this capability, especially if you're leaning toward a scope with a record length of millions of samples. Many Tektronix scopes include a neat facility called Wave Inspector to help you navigate through long records. It's made up of dedicated controls on the front panel to allow you to quickly search, pan, and zoom. I can't spend much time on it here, but you can see demos of it on our website. You can see the results of a search above. The hits are indicated by white triangles in both the acquisition overview and the zoom view on the slide. Wave Inspector duplicates most of the trigger functions as search functions. For example, you can trigger on a pulse that is higher than 1 volt for less than 10 nanoseconds. Then you can use the same criteria to search for similar pulses to see how many you captured and get an idea how often the glitch occurs. I wasn't sure whether to talk about capture rate as a hard spec or as an advanced feature. In the end, I decided to keep capture rate and digital phosphor together. Capturing intermittent events is an exercise in probability. Imagine that I'm trying to take a picture of someone blinking with my camera. Now, what you need to know about my digital pocket camera is that it has a really long cycle time. Because of the latency between snapshots, I can only catch someone blinking by sheer luck. And I must be pretty lucky because I catch people blinking a lot. You could also imagine that if I had a much faster camera, I would have a better chance of catching the blink. This is illustrated with the upper graphic on the slide as we try unsuccessfully to capture an infrequent runt pulse on a scope with a low waveform capture rate and then successfully on a scope with a much faster update rate. So waveform capture rate tells how fast the instrument can acquire, store, and display data. And it also gives you a sense of how likely it is that you'll be able to capture infrequent events. Now in addition to being able to capture the waveforms, the instrument needs to be able to display the information in a way that makes sense. Just because the scope can capture thousands of waveforms per second doesn't mean our eye can see them all. So some scopes have the ability to use intensity grading to represent how often an event occurs. Infrequent events appear dim and frequent events appear brighter. Because it looks like the phosphor on an analog CRT, Tektronix calls this function digital phosphor and you'll find it on Tektronix scopes from basic bench models to high-performance lab instruments. The lower picture on the slide shows how a digital si signal varies in time relative to the trigger which is off the left-hand side of the screen. You can see by the intensity 
that the rising edge spends most of its time in the center of the screen, but moves over about four divisions. And occasionally, the edge happens even sooner. Most designs today use serial buses for inter-chip or module-to-module -module communications. These have traditionally been tough to troubleshoot on scopes, just by virtue of their serial nature. But with longer record length and more processing power, some scopes are able to decode serial buses and use the decoded information for triggering and searching. Some buses, especially really common intermodule buses like RS-232 and USB 2.0, can be decoded by relatively cheap bus sniffers. The difference between the scope approach and a standalone bus decoder is that the scope allows you to look at any related signals on a time-correlated display, allowing you to see how bus commands sync up with other events in your system. This slide shows a table taken from the Tektronix DPO3000 series datasheet. It shows how ser serial buses are bundled together as options and what functions are supported for each serial bus. We haven't talked about event tables, but this lets you see a decoded bus states on the scope display. If you work with serial buses, make sure you check the scope's data sheet to see what's available for the specific models you're considering. I'm going to cover a number of analysis features in this next sequence. Depending on how important these features are for you, you'll want to spend more or less time researching them. I'll touch on each one very quickly and try to give you a sense of how common each one is. Cursors are offered in most scopes today, and most scopes allow you to use them to pick off values from the vertical or horizontal axes. The cursor shown on the slide automatically indicate the waveform value at the cursor position. The ability to add and subtract channel waveforms has been around for a long time, and most scopes have some capabilities in this department. At the very least, you'll want to be able to subtract the channels to make pseudo-differential measurements. It's also very common to want to multiply channels together to get power. The range of math cap capabilities goes from this kind of simple function all the way to being able to enter complex expressions with constants, calculus, and trigonometric functions. You may be able to get some sense for the math capabilities for a scope from the data sheet, but if this is really important to you, I'd recommend downloading the user manual and taking a look through it to see what's doable. Automatic waveform measurements let you take numerical readings based on the waveform. Some form of automatic measurements is available on most scopes, but the range of capabilities varies a lot. Measurements often include time-related parameters like pulse width, period, frequency, and rise time and amplitude-related parameters like min and max voltage, peak-to-peak, -peak, or RMS voltage. Some scopes can give statistical measurements like histograms or even jitter and eye pattern measurements. One way scopes can distinguish themselves is in how flexible they make it to gate measurements. Does the measurement happen over the whole record length, just over the display, or just between the cursors? On some instruments, you can set this. You can also see from the example on the slide that you can get statistics like mean and minimum for measurements. Max and standard deviation are also available on this instrument, but they're hidden in the example. The user manual is probably the best place to learn about automated, automatic measurements. Limit testing and mask testing are similar, so I'll cover them at the same time. Limit testing is not universally available on scopes because not everybody does this kind of testing and it takes some time to set up. It can be very useful though in pass-fail testing and qualification and manufacturing. The limit test software compares a signal under test to a known good or golden version of the signal with user-defined vertical and horizontal tolerances. Mask testing is also used somewhat narrowly so it's generally an option and not a standard feature. It's usually used to check telecommunications and data transfer signals for compliance to a standard like ITUT, Ethernet, or USB, or others. If you're interested in this type of testing for general purpose use as opposed to compliance testing, you may also want to take a look at visual triggering that's available on our DPO 5000 and higher. 
Visual triggering allows you to draw shapes on the display and have the scope trigger whenever the signal moves in or out of the shape you've drawn. It's designed more for general purpose triggering. Many scopes offer a fast Fourier transform function that allows you to look at the frequency spectrum of your signals. If this is important in your work, you may want to spend some time understanding how the FFT operates on the scope. There are a few things to look at. What information the FFT gives on the screen. On the screen above, you'll notice the vertical and horizontal scales, as well as the record length and sample rate. These are all good to know as you're evaluating your FFT. You'll definitely want to use cursors on the FFT display, and most scopes support this. Try to find out what memory the FFT operates on. Ideally, the FFT should use the full memory of the scope to get the best frequency resolution. Performing the FFT only on the display memory makes the display update quickly, but you lose frequency resolution. If you're going to be doing a lot of RF work, then you might want to consider a mixed domain oscilloscope. This is a new class of instrument that's only been around for less than a year. They have a dedicated RF input and spectrum analysis controls for displaying signals in the frequency domain. The key words on the slide are time correlated. You can see what an RF spectrum looks like at a specific time and also see analog and digital values at the same time including serial buses. You can also look at traces of frequency, power, and phase changes on the RF channel over time and relate these to analog and digital signals at other points in your system. If you get into specialized applications, you'll probably want to investigate application software, especially on mid-range and high-performance scopes. We've already talked about RF applications a bit in reference to the MDO. But if you're working down in the nitty-gritty of signal integrity for digital communications, you may want to look at scope applications that can demodulate high-speed signals, display the spectrum and spectrograms, and pluck out symbols from the data stream. These applications generally make sense only on scopes with bandwidths in the multi-gigahertz ranges. If you get involved in power supply design or evaluation, you'll want to look into power application modules. These allow you to measure power parameters like harmonics, switching loss, and safe operating area. These applications are available starting on mid-range instruments in the 100 megahertz range. Jitter measurements are used to evaluate frequency and phase variations in clocks and data streams. This type of measurement generally requires a really fast sampling rate, high time stability, and long record length. So jitter measurements are usually done with high-end scopes. And compliance testing is a requirement to claim compatibility with standards like Ethernet and USB. This type of testing is also the domain of high-end scopes. In this last section, we'll talk about how a scope fits in your work environment. Very few people fall in the middle when you ask this question. Do you prefer your scope to use a proprietary operating system? or run under Windows. There are clear camps on this issue, but once you get beyond all the ranting and raving on one side or the other, the answer can have as much to do with the application as it does with passion. If you're going to be doing a lot of work with analysis or simulation as you're gathering the signals, you may want to consider going with Windows. If you're mainly doing general debug, well, the operating system question may get back to which camp you're in. Tools and techniques for control and data transfer are a topic that could easily fill another hour. Unfortunately, we can, can just touch on it here. For transferring data directly to a computer or remotely controlling a scope, you have a number of alternatives. USB is probably the easiest alternative for quick transfers, and it's available on virtually all PCs, and the cabling is foolproof. Ethernet is a close second choice, and while it may take a bit more setup time, it has the advantage that many scopes can serve up a home page like the one shown on this slide. GPIB requires special hardware and spendy cables, so unless you're working on test stands, most people stay clear of it. An RS-232 is rarely seen anymore due to its slow speed and tricky setup. 
Most manufacturers offer programs that you can use to grab screens, settings, or waveform data over one or more of the interfaces above. Tektronix calls our utility Open Choice Desktop. If you're a LabVIEW user, drivers are kept on the National Instruments website. You can usually just search for the scope's model number, and this will bring up the drivers if they're available. IVI class drivers are also pretty common and these are usually available from the scope manufacturer's website. Most scopes today offer a USB port that can be used to connect a USB flash drive. This is a handy way to store waveforms, screen captures, and settings. I use this method most often to move screens from scopes to my PC. Higher end scopes also have hard drives that can store lots of waveforms and settings. The most common printer interface today uses the PicBridge standard that was designed for directly connecting cameras to printers. In this case, the scope pretends that it's a camera and transmits its screen as a photo. And finally, some scopes offer a VGA output, either standard or as an option, that can be used to drive an external monitor. Our probe design engineers like to say that an oscilloscope is just a display for probes. This doesn't impress our scope engineers much. But the fact remains that probes are a critical part of the system. Check the probing alternatives for any scope you're considering. In today's scopes, the instruments and probes can communicate with each other. This allows the scope to not only sense the right scale factors, but it also lets you change factors or ranges on the scope front panel. The scope can tell you right on the screen when a current probe jaw is open, and it can guide you through procedures like current probe degaussing. Battery-powered scopes are great for field use for obvious reasons. They're portable and don't need a power outlet. But they're also well suited for measurements on systems with multiple grounds or floating systems. Bench scopes reference all of their measurements to earth ground. The input channels on the two scopes shown here are isolated from ground and from each other. Other than isolation specs and battery life, these scopes have similar specs and capabilities to the ones I've covered. That's about all we have time for. I know it's a lot to take in, but I hope you're leaving knowing more than when you started. Now I'll take some questions from the audience. We had a few come in during the presentation and we'll take those first, but feel free to keep asking them.